Welcome to the MS Dev Show, episode number 160. This week, we talk with John Daniel Trask about software quality and performance, a riveting analysis of the clipboard, why Reddit chose TypeScript, and what if authors of computer programming books wrote arithmetic books. Raygun gives you complete visibility on errors, crashes, and performance problems affecting your end users. Replicate issues in seconds rather than digging through log files or having to rely on users to report errors or crashes. Raygun gives you a window into how users are really experiencing your software applications. Check it out today at raygun.com. This episode of the MS Dev Show is brought to you by Aspose, the market leader of .NET and Java APIs for file business formats. Natively work with DocX, XSLX, PPT, PDF, MSG, MPP, image formats, and many more. This week we have John Daniel Trask, co-founder and CEO of Raygun, a crash reporting and real user monitoring company, and he's a nine-time Microsoft MVP. Welcome to the show. Again. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me again. Yeah, and I guess full disclosure, like, uh, you know, Raygun is a sponsor of the the show, which is kind of how we get this conversation started. Um, because you, you go around, you know, being an MVP, you go around and you do lots of presentations, you do lots of blog posts. There's, you know, some of your work just, you know, sort of pops up on my radar uh, organically. And uh, so it's like, hey, let, let's talk to this guy. And, you know, we, we already talked to you about Raygun the last time you were on. So I was like, hey, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about some <laughs> some other things that are, you know, a little tangent, tangential, but uh, but we'll talk about them. Uh, so, Carl, what's going on with that conference? It's that conference up. is, yeah, it's only three weeks away. And oh, that's, that's pretty crazy. That's um, not true. <laughs> it's, it is true. <laughs> no way. And, and, and I got reminded because I was talking uh, to a couple of people who are going to be there. Uh, and they're actually traveling quite a distance, and it's always nice to meet up with uh, you know friends that you've meeting around the world. And, and considering this one, at least for me, not for you anymore, Jason, is local. Mm-hmm. It is pretty exciting when you know people travel to you for a conference uh, for when you're from the Midwest. Mm-hmm. So that that's always really nice to uh, uh, to experience. So. Uh, once again, uh, for we've been saying this a few episodes in a row, we are going to be at that conference, and we are um, looking forward to meeting you. So if you're a fan of the show, uh, stop on over. Uh, we will have some new swag I'm having made up. I know Jason doesn't like the price tag, but... <laughs> <laughs> Carl had to badger me a lot to actually purchase them. <laughs> yes. So we, we will have new stuff to hand out, which I always love. That's one of my favorite parts is yeah. giving away things. So come on over. Uh, just talk to us. And uh, if you want, you know, you know, uh, we'll record it. We'll put it on the show. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we talk to anybody who comes up to us and, and if they have something to say. We record it, and if it's really terrible, we just, I was going to say, we put it at the end, but now somebody's going to go back. <laughs> somebody's <laughs> somebody's going to go back to the last time we didn't figure out what was at the end. So, no, we just, it's completely random. We just randomize them. So, you'll be at a random location probably at the end, though. Uh, okay. I feel like I might just wait till the end now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so what do we have for the comment of the week, Carl? Uh, the comment of the week is uh, from Danny Warren on Twitter. Uh, I met up with him a few years ago, and he got one of our uh, original hats that we made. Mm-hmm. And he was wearing it. I don't know exactly where. It looks like some sort of a festival. He has a picture, uh, World's Best Corn Dogs. Wow. So what, what are the odds? They were. I know. <laughs> and he said he was just walking around, and somebody came up to him and started a conversation to him because of the MS Dev Show hat, because they were awesome. a fan of the show. So I, I, I'm actually really curious who this other person was. I see a picture of him. Uh, let us know your name. Uh, definitely pretty cool that you guys got together because of the show. Um, that's exactly the kind of things that we like um, – going to conferences for and the reason why we have our slack channels just to have a way for uh people in our profession to get together and be social you know we should uh oh this is gonna make work for me but this is like real-time podcast idea uh anybody who posts a picture like with our swag we should like send them more swag because they're obviously using the swag that we sent them so um hopefully and you so you said he's going to be at uh, that conference he, yeah danny's actually going to be at that conference well, I let's, believe- let's hook him up then yeah, I, I already told him he, he'll get a new hat. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I, we should have some mug. I don't know if you have any mugs, but we'll, we'll have to get him a mug I, somehow. And... 
Yeah, I, I have stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get through the, the TSA with a whole bunch of mugs. <laughs> we'll see what happens there. All right. And uh, if you want to get mentioned on the show like Danny, send us an email to feedback at msdevshow.com, comment on Facebook, Stitcher, and we really love those five-star iTunes reviews. Awesome. Okay, let's move into the news. So you have a riveting two-part series on how the Windows clipboard works. Yeah, th- this is pretty cool. And this is a little bit older post. It's from 2012. But I mean, the clipboard is something that we use all the time. I mean, a lot of us control C, control V all day long, uh, you know, from Stack Overflow to whatever we're working on, right? Yeah, the only way and I like code. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way. And the only way to refactor is by deleting. So, um, you know, he had a, an opportunity. He, he's uh, a developer at Microsoft and he was... Uh, debugging the clipboard. He was working on it for some reason. And this two-part blog post came out of it and just kind of like summarizing how how the clipboard actually works. Because a lot of times you think, you know, you just copy something in there, it sits in some buffer in memory, and then you hit paste and it, you know, just gets copied over to another buffer. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he kind of explained that it's actually sitting in there in multiple different formats in a lot of cases. So if you copy like some, especially like from Word, you have some some text that's in a specific font. Some of it's bolded, some of it's not. Some of it's in a color. There happens to be a picture, or a table, or a chart in there. I mean, that takes that's pretty complicated data. So it's actually sitting in there multiple times because uh, whatever you're pasting it to might not be able to accept all of those different formats. And he actually includes like memory location addresses and you know ways for you to replicate some of this stuff invest in an investigatory way. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was just really cool. Even though we as developers aren't going to hit this low level, just understanding what's going on be- behind the scenes really does help your understanding when you are just doing like uh, maybe a WinRT call, you know, you know, clipboard.set text. And that's all you're doing. You can understand behind the scenes, hey, it's doing all these other things. Yeah, and I think even like LastPass, my understanding is, I I don't know the details about the timing, but you can set it up so like whenever you copy a password, like it it will remove it from memory after a certain time because conceivably like another program could be sitting there waiting for you to like paste some critical information onto the the clipboard. So um, yeah, it's very cool. It's something that we just take for granted. Like, oh yeah, this this thing just works, but you know, it works with images or whatever, yeah. And there's even a way where... Uh, you can say, I have something to paste. When you actually do paste it, we're not actually going to put it in the clipboard. You'll just call me mm. and I'll we'll do that transaction behind oh, that's the cool. scene. That's cool. So there's ways for all of that kind of stuff to happen. Very cool. And for the next news story, why Reddit chose TypeScript? Yeah, uh, I thought this was pretty cool because you know one reddit is just huge and everybody i know uses reddit and i don't really use it as reddit site i don't know it's (laughs) it's a place for us to put memes up i think okay cool but but anyways they were looking at um you know replacements for javascript and you like they looked at tons of different options and then if you look at their list they put like 11 things on there Mm -hmm. and that wasn't all of them that they looked at and they were like, you know, what are we looking to accomplish? They wanted a typing system, good tooling, uh, examples of it already being used in other production applications and uh, works on client and server with good library support. And as they went through all of these different things, they kind of narrowed it down to TypeScript. And I think the other one was Flow. And at the end, at the end, I think it was the ecosystem of TypeScript that really won them over. Mm-hmm. But they said when it was done, said and done, they couldn't be happier with their choice to move to TypeScript. And I know there's a lot of people out there in this situation that are kind of looking at TypeScript. And um, I know a lot of times we do look to some of the the leaders in the industry uh, for examples of what they're doing as to be indicators of what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, TypeScript is just amazing. I mean, it's 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 one of those technologies that is making, you know, the people that that sort of counted out Microsoft or they're they're like, oh, they're just this evil corporation over there trying to make money. It's one of those technologies where people are looking at it and be like, oh, well, this is cool. You know, so Microsoft is evil, but this is cool. And then they're like, oh, wait, like there's also VS Code. Well, that's cool, too. But Microsoft maybe (laughs) isn't so evil. And it's like after a while, it's like, wait a second. Microsoft is making a ton of cool stuff. Maybe I need to kind of reevaluate this whole thing. And I think TypeScript, especially whenever you you pair it with like VS Code, I mean, you could be doing this on Linux, on a Mac. Um, it it is it is just incredible. And and uh, what I found, I cannot write more than, 
you know, like three different files worth of Java or JavaScript before I have to bring in something like TypeScript to maintain my sanity, especially whenever you have some kind of object that um, like, you know, what properties it has and you're trying to f have it flow through the system. Uh, JavaScript is just complete anarchy. I mean, Anders, the, the creator of TypeScript, I mean, he, he was the one that said, you know, you just you can't. Well, and, and of course, I'm, I'm probably screwing it up because this sounds like it could be easily proven incorrect, but like you can't create like a large scale JavaScript application or, or Node.js application uh, without using something like TypeScript because, you know, it's just that level of insanity and, and uh, um, craziness just, just gets out of hand and then it, you start to lose stability in the system. So you have to layer something like this in. Um, so actually, I should I should ask then, uh, JD, if, if the... Uh, um, I know Raygun was in Node, and maybe parts of it still are. Were you guys using TypeScript? So um, <clears throat> the Node part, which we'll come back to later, yeah, is, yeah. Uh, was just the API layer for receiving data. Oh, I gotcha. Um, the app itself is all .NET, C Sharp. Um, we, all, of, all of our front end was built with JavaScript using Marionette and Backbone back in the day. Oh, okay. And we are currently in the process uh, with, we're bringing a third piece to the platform later this year. And that is all being uh, written using TypeScript and uh, React okay. as the new sort of uh, stuff there. So, and, and in, in fact, going back to the past a little bit further, we actually, uh, as a company, built a product called Web Workbench um, before it was sort of superseded by Microsoft's uh, Web Essentials, which had uh, about 250,000 users using um, CoffeeScript inside of Visual Studio, which is sort of a precursor to that stuff. Um, and I'm with you. Like, uh, I... I always say to people, you know, I've been programming long enough that I still have PTSD from using JavaScript in the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Like I know I it know. Just like, it used to be just like eyes that would follow you or like snowflakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But and then so when I, I sort of stumbled onto CoffeeScript back in the day and was kind of like, this, this is better. This, you know, I like inheritance where I just kind of use a colon in the other class. I don't want to have to to go to crazy town on this. And CoffeeScript helped me with that. It also helped you not blow your own feet off by having this sort of compilation phase, if you will, where it would tell you if something was wrong or yeah. even little th simple things like double equals will compile to a triple equals to ensure the type is correct. You know, like, yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. JavaScript is just like, Every every time you like push a key, it's like ship it, ship it, ship it, ship it. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, the, the the flip side to that at the same time in my mind is that if I was, te if somebody if somebody met me and said, you know, I've got a teenager that's looking to find out what programming was about, I'd probably suggest something like Node to them today. Is like pull down this one thing, you know, mm -hmm. ignore the fact that it expands to about forty billion things, but you know, yeah. and then run it up on your computer and just see how quickly you can get into that yeah. feedback. Thank you. That, you know, that's, it's funny. Cause like you're, you're like the first person and uh, other person I ran into that didn't think that was crazy. Um, cause I've even overheard people talking about like what first language you use and they'll be in, in like, they'll never mention node or they'll be like, you know, like, Oh, something like node would just be terrible. Uh, but the reality is, you know, I think, I think JavaScript itself, like the fundamental JavaScript, I, and I think I've mentioned on the show before, like you can write anything with it. And I think, yeah. I think that's, that's part of the appeal. And like you said, just the, the starting with it. Now, of course the complexity gets, you know, out of hand super fast, but you know, <laughs> if you do, you know, if, if one of my kids wants to make some simple like browser game or something, um, yep. that's pretty incredible. You just go in the file and then you hit refresh. Or if you want to make a web server backend for it, like creating that would be pretty simple. And, um, so I actually think that's a great place to start. Yeah, I started with uh, QBasic back in the day. And I think that's the thing. You, you don't want too much surface area, and it's got to just kind of work out of yeah. the box, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so our last one here, <laughs> I love this, because uh, I didn't I didn't read the title at first, and I, I just I just clicked on the link, and I don't know if you have a copy of this here, J.D., where the uh, it, it's it's this picture on Imager, uh, however you pronounce that, and it says, suppose you have one rabbit, and it shows a picture of a rabbit, and it says, now suppose someone gives you one more rabbit, uh, now, if you count your rabbits, you have two rabbits. So one plus one rabbit equals two rabbits. So one plus one equals two. And that's how arithmetic is done. 
Now that you understand the basic idea between or behind arithmetic, let's take a look at an easy to understand example that puts into practice what we just learned. It says, try it out, example 1.7, and it's... <laughs> and then it's got like a 15-line calculus <laughs> equation. Yeah, yeah, this is like super advanced calculus. I have no, I don't even know what I'm looking at here. And uh, I just started laughing when I said, because I think this by itself is just hilarious. Um, because you know, this is what happens my kids on their math homework. It's they've, they've even had stuff that obviously wasn't like this bad, but you know, it was like kind of a similar thing. Uh, and then at the bottom it says, if the authors of computer programming books wrote arithmetic books, uh, it is so true though. Um, I have a, a thousand page, uh, C plus plus book and, uh, it actually tells you nothing about how you would actually do anything with C plus plus. Like it's literally just here is like every excruciating detail about the language itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and it frustrated me because, because like when, when I was growing up and I try, was trying to get into programming, um, I actually, <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever shared this with anybody. I, I actually went into a bookstore and I said, you know, like, Hey, I, a bookstore. And I said, I want to, uh, learn programming. Uh, like what language should I start with? And the guy said, oh, C++. So I bought, you know, some C++ books. <laughs> and like I read these things like pretty much cover to cover. And I was like, I still don't get how to program. Because <laughs> I'm just like, because this was the time when like Windows was like, you know, starting to get popular. And I'm like, like, how do I create a window? I'm like, I get the syntax. Like, how do we yeah. create a window? And like, that was like a whole different series of books. <laughs> yep. I was exactly the same. So yeah. I mentioned QBasic at the start. It was about 90 four i guess and then windows 95 kind of came along and that was the thing i did this, the exact same thing i, I was like okay i want to move off qbasic because that's in dos now i'm going to go and move to c or c plus plus and it was all pointers and i was like okay i get pointers but how do i put a window on the <laughs> damn screen <laughs> like you know like Never went into exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So it's literally over a thousand pages. Look at this thing for people who are on video. <laughs> Look how big that is. Okay. This is actually a really cool book. And even on the back, it says uh, it's C plus plus primer plus covers the ANSI slash ISO C plus plus standard. Explain C plus plus from the ground up. Guides the reader through complex topics without assuming prior knowledge. Emphasizes hands on learning. Includes C plus plus features such as templates, exceptions, RTTI, and namespaces. Introduces new library features such as the string class and the standard template library. Like that's like at the end is like, <laughs> here's a string. <laughs> uh, and then, and then it has all, it says includes Adobe Acrobat reader co or no Acrobat reader, code warrior light and all the source code on the CD-ROM. So let's just see like page. Let's see what is on page like 782. Uh, generic programming. Yeah. The string class and the standard template library. That's, that's toward the end of the book. And look, it's like, it's like fine print. <laughs> and, and well, like, when you listed off the items there, it started with templates. You're yeah. like, really? That's your primer is to start at template? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I don't know. I still got the CD ROM in here too. So the thing is just, it's just epic. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an epic book. Uh, so it's kind of the same thing. I'm like, that doesn't teach you anything. And then, and then now with my kids, I'm like, Hey, why don't you write some JavaScript in the browser? And that's like, they write like five lines of code and they like have something working and they, you know, they don't understand the, the inner stuff, but it like motivates them to understand how it's working then under the cover. So anyway, that was a bit of a tangent, but uh, that's all we have for news. Uh, so let's jump into the, the, uh, the, the questions that we have for you, because you had, um, uh, you had a blog post recently and it was about moving from uh, node to was it to .NET Core? It was to .NET Core. Okay, awesome. What version of .NET Core did you use? One point one, I think. Okay, okay. Other time. So, um, I I think I, I think I saw this on Hacker News actually, um, mm -hmm. and there were a whole bunch of uh, of comments there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Uh, <laughs> so I guess the first thing is like, why did you make that move? Like, what what was the motivating factor there? Um, so for several reasons, it's important to understand the history of our API. So we started off where we, um, so I mentioned the whole app is written in .NET and that's obviously on Windows machines. Mm -hmm. And our API is pretty dumb as most APIs are. It just, you know, checks a couple of headers, make sure there's an appropriate simple, blob attached. Simple is probably the word. <laughs> yep. And so... <laughs> It, uh, we originally were like, well, we don't want to be paying for Windows boxes for that mm -hmm. just because we were, you know, a poor, tiny company. And so we wanted Linux boxes. And um, <laughs> we, we went with um, Mono to begin with. And keep in mind, this is sort of like four years ago, I guess, five now. Okay. And that thing 
um, just loved bleeding memory. Like it was, it was not a, a good setup. And so we, we wanted to migrate to something else that was on Linux. We picked Node at the time because we appreciated that our API um, received lots of short-lived requests mm. sending data through, and the model that Node had um, seemed to be pretty well suited to it. And so we put it in place, um, and that was good, and the world was fine, and the company kept growing. And so we ended up where we had this uh, sort of fleet of servers that were, and they're not particularly powerful servers either, but there was a lot of them for redundancy purposes, and they're in an auto scale group. Um, and so when .NET Core started being developed, we got pretty excited about that because of the cross-platform play. The other thing is, um, you know, I have bordering on uh, sexual fetish level interest in optimization and re efficient code. Like mm. talking about, hey, the 90s in coding, I still sit there and kind of go, how does one Xeon machine not like run just friggin' everything like compared to what we used to be able to do. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Well, and actually it can. I mean, that's the reality. <laughs> like we've had, we've talked to like Stack Overflow and they're like, oh, we've tested on one machine and we can do it. Yeah. One of the most popular <laughs> sites on the entire internet. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff left on the table. So when Microsoft sort of started uh, with .NET Core and took a really serious performance uh, angle with it, mm -hmm. we got really excited. And so my business partner, uh, Jeremy Boyd, he's a Microsoft regional director. And so um, he sort of started playing around with it well before version one and was just looking at it, not necessarily to start with from our API standpoint, but just wanted to find a small piece of work that he could run up as a sort of proof of concept. Um, and so it just happened that he started looking at our API because it was relatively simple. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it came up, uh, I think when about the time .NET Core went version one, uh, we started putting it into the set. So we weren't running the entire API layer there. And then when it uh, went 1.1, we, we moved it over. Um, and so <laughs> cutting back to the comments, everybody seemed to be like, you must be doing Node wrong. There's no way that it's that, that <laughs> slow. And it's kind of like, well, you can go and actually look at a lot of benchmarks pointing out that Node is not exactly fast. No. Um, and so it got to the point but where man, it's like, they, they got, they got a whole bunch of free, I, well, and, and they, I don't even know who I mean by they, I mean, I, I really mean, no, like got a, a ton of marketing. Um, and just, I, I don't know how this happened, but like overnight, everybody was like, you know, if I want something fast, I have to use node. And it's really yeah. amazing. Like that, that just, it just like caught on and it's like implanted. It's like inception in like everybody's brains all of a sudden that, you know, I need it fast. So therefore I need node. Yeah, and the weird thing is, is you know that we had people say, "Oh, but Node is multi-threaded," and it's like, "Yeah, if you burrow down low enough, but you've effectively got this event loop that then also has a task uh, queue." And of course, we were running on relatively small machines, so it was one of those ones where it's like, "Well, yeah, sure, the event loop can keep running, but whatever it's doing with how it handles that task queue, it clearly has some sort of overhead." And credit to Microsoft, I feel like they kind of know what they're doing with building these. Um, these programming languages and platforms is whatever they're doing is is giving us a benefit in, in their concurrency handling over what Node is doing. So they might still be using the same underlying threading library on, on uh, Linux, but at the end of the day, there is a cost in there somewhere. And, you know, short of me probably pulling all of the machine code that would be required on every request and dumping out a comparison, nobody wants to believe us. Um, but it's been a phenomenal performance improvement. The other thing too is we process billions and billions of requests. Yeah, so I figure something it's being all like, events. yeah, being it can be a relatively small improvement that stacks up to a pretty yeah. huge uh, improvement for us. If you were running a long running task, single task, it might be somewhat comparable. I doubt it, but uh, you know, it could be just the workload yeah. um, in there. So and and you know even looking at what they're bringing down the pipe with .NET Core two where it's like twenty five percent faster again, I'm like man that's amazing you know I I really I I really was biting my tongue at wanting to go and write on the Microsoft blog post and just say you must have been doing .NET Core one point one wrong because there's no way it could be that much faster. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily you have lots of self control. Uh, so <laughs> I I did want to dive into like the tech stack then so so obviously you're using Linux for. Uh, for yeah. Node, so are you still using Linux then for .NET Core? Yeah. So what do yeah. you use for the front end web servers then? Are you using Kestrel? For well, for we we do have Kestrel in the mix with a I think it's uh, Nginx is also sitting in front of there. We we talk okay. a lot 
Microsoft folks about how security hardened Kestrel is. And my understanding, yeah. and, and, and double check me on this, was that um, their sort of uh, comment has been that, hey, version two is when they're going to have like ticked off the security hardening side of stuff with Kestrel. In terms of the app itself, however, that is um, all just latest IIS um, and all okay. of that. Yeah, it's yeah. not running on core. Well, it's just the ingestion on the API side. Yeah, which actually brings up a good point too. People have it in their mind that, oh, IIS is slow. And, you know, that might have been the case like back in like IIS 6. Um, but, you know, it eventually changed. So it was more it was more of like how Apache did it, where you'd like sort of chain these modules together. And IIS for, for acting as like a front end, like pass through or serving like static files is a beast. I mean, it is super mm -hmm. fast. So like using... IIS in front of uh, Node, for example, or in front of .NET Core, um, is actually pretty incredible. Like it's really not slowing down that that stack at all. And uh, so I can do your I can do some real time fact checking here on your Kestrel. So I happen to actually just answer this question. Uh, so if you go and look at the release notes for um, uh, um, .NET Core 2.0 release two, which just came out like I think a few days ago. Um, there, there is a comment in the release notes about them adding in the functionality, uh, required for that being, you know, kind of sitting on the internet and being a little bit more secure security hardened. Um, there was a comment from, you know, Damien Edwards, uh, he sent me an email and he's like, well, I, 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 I actually, I probably shouldn't even repeat it cause I, I'm just going <laughs> to screw it up. But like, you know, the thing is still in preview as well. So you got to kind of factor yeah. that in, but, but the, the general point is that whenever, you know, AS or whenever .NET Core 2.0 comes out, uh, you know, the, the, the theory is that you'll be able to run Kestrel straight on the web and uh, you're going to get, I mean, maybe even more than that 25% boost, right? Because you are going to be removing IIS from the mix, which is probably not impacting it that much, but still, I mean, just removing another piece from that pipeline could, could make a difference. Yeah. Well, like I say, I love uh, simplicity and efficiency. Yeah. So uh, anything to make it easier is always good. Yeah. And if you go look, there's like some official benchmarks for, uh, Kestrel, or should, not for Kestrel, for different like uh, uh, languages and, and web servers. And uh, Kestrel is on that list and they use uh, WRK for a test client. And I th I think Kestrel's number one, maybe they're number two. Um, I don't, I haven't looked at it a while. I don't, I don't remember what the positioning was, uh, but they are kicking butt on performance. It's really incredible. They're talking, they tested on physical hardware and they're like well over like a million requests per second. Um, and I actually had... Um, um, so a company I was working with, they did some testing around it and they, they replicated all those results as well, uh, which is, which is pretty amazing. So how many, how many servers then do you have serving out that front end? Um, so again, I'm, I'll talk API specifically, which yeah, is, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is just that, a fraction that, of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that bounces usually between about sort of eight and 25 servers okay. at a time, depending on the workload. We sort of, one of the things that was quite valuable for us as well was it wasn't just a case of saying, let's say hypothetically, um, you know, it's two times better so we could reduce the cluster size you know, by two thirds, uh, what we did was we did not reduce it by as much as we had saved so that we could leave a larger warm pool because we typically mm -hmm. do run into things where there can be massive spikes. So, you know, we might go from um, processing, say, 20,000 requests a second to suddenly be like, oh, now it's 500,000 requests a second. Mm -hmm. um, and so maintaining a reasonably large warm pool is really important in that set. So it just, it makes it both uh, more cost effective by reducing down, but also our ability to, to have that warm pool be large while saving money is useful. So when you did this transition from node uh, to ASP.NET Core, did you kind of move everything over at once or was it kind of gradual? Like what kind of strategy did you use there? Yeah, so one of the things that we did was, um, it was twofold actually was uh, we, before the show started, I mentioned that we used to live at raygun.io and we moved to raygun.com. And so our API lives at api.raygun.io or .com. And so we um, did two things. One was we started transitioning the API calls to the .com address and we did that from our own apps to begin with. So we just set up one node mm. to receive, receive the data and use .NET Core for that, knowing that we were the only people calling it. And then what we did was, we started putting um, a single um, 
uh, server into that auto scaling block that was running the .NET Core one to run it by comparison. Of course, we have monitoring on all those servers, and that was where we were like, oh, "This server seems to be um, basically not not sweating as hard trying to do the <laughs> same amount of work," you know. And that was where we started uh, to to measure things and and figure out how to get the most out of it. And then at, over time, we phased it out where we put in more and more uh, once we were sure that uh, we weren't seeing any oddities. Um, with the data that was coming through or any, you know, our rates of errors being returned weren't changing. Um, so, for example, when I say that, it's because we do reject some data based on being malformed or or things like that. So that was our, our approach to rolling it out. And then finally, we just replaced the base image on all of the auto scale group and cycled out the old node ones and left .NET Core uh, to do the job. That's very cool. Um, so, I mean, did this have, there was obviously some effort to swap this out. So I, did it meet your kind of ROI goals? Like, was it, was it worth the time investment then? Well, I, I think it, it met the ROI goals um, fairly quickly by allowing us to reduce the server count by about a third on a pure dollar basis. Yeah. The other side of the, the coin as well is that um, Jeremy, you know, was going to be looking at, you know, his job as CTO is to, to keep an eye on all these new technologies and see where we could benefit from some of these things. And so he would have spent that time even if he'd ultimately decided it was not a wise move to go ahead with. So that, in a way, is already just a sunk cost that the business was going to to absorb anywho. So um, it's really nice when that stuff turns out. I mean, to be honest with you, um, we've built entire products in the past that we've decided not to ship because they didn't reach uh, our quality bar or feel like they were uniquely competitive in any way. So we've always been pretty aggressive um, on that R&D front and not just shipping because we've put the time into things. But that that project in particular showed a positive ROI pretty quickly on a pure dollar terms basis. So was when you went through with this project, is there any side effects or surprises or anything that you learned that you didn't expect? Uh, no, not really from a from the sort of business and ops standpoint. I think um, you know there, there there were quite a few hurdles to jump through when .NET Core was approaching the version one stuff in terms of API surface and what what classes were implemented. And that was where uh, you know, in terms of its base class library expanding dramatically over time, and obviously is expanding more all of the time. So there were some challenges around that when you've come from the full .NET framework to kind of go, what is in here and what is a bit different? Um, so there was that, but I don't, um, I guess in a way, I wouldn't say that was overly surprising, <laughs> but it was a bit of a challenge. So... You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not even sure what I'm trying to ask here, so I'm just going <laughs> to ask it. The best questions. <laughs> well, yeah, like... it's a facial moisturizer that I use. I know you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. Um, no, so it, it's kind of interesting. Like, we, we keep coming up with, like, new new languages. And, and I guess in this case, it's a framework, right? Because we say Node and we say .NET Core, and those aren't languages. Um, but really, when it comes down, it's like JavaScript versus .NET um and like we we keep bouncing around and it's like oh now go is the new thing or this is the new thing over here and i don't does the language really matter i mean is it how you use it like i i don't know again i'm, I'm not quite sure what i'm what i'm trying to ask because it it just seems like we keep just changing things like almost for the for the sake of changing it and in this case obviously like you i asked you you know you had the roi it makes sense but like like you know, is it something about the language? Like, I, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on that. You know, you just, it's, it's just yeah, a different well, language, but different guts underneath. Well, I'll tell you a story. I had a chat with uh, one of our customers recently. They reached out and had seen the same story about the .NET Core move. And they uh, said that they were evaluating going to Node or .NET Core <laughs> for their new API yeah. stuff and wanted to get my thoughts on it. And, um, you know, it was effectively that question, like, why would we pick it? And sometimes, I, you know, for us, we wanted the performance angle was, mm -hmm. was the key driver there. Having said that, we also have a large team of engineers now that are C, very comfortable with C Sharp and the, the, the .NET stack. And so sometimes, you know, from my point of view, um, 
if that means that I can get more of our team able to work on that, that's not to say they can't write JavaScript in Node, but if they're not particularly experienced with it or they're not touching it a whole lot, um, they might not be the best uh, people to work on that. So from that standpoint, I was interested in that. They had a different challenge, which was uh, I believe they were somewhere that didn't actually have that many C-sharp developers in the area. So they were almost thinking possibly going with another language to broaden their ability to recruit. Um, yeah. I've heard, I, you know, I've actually heard that many times before is like, Hey, yeah. our company was trying to pick what language to use and they based it off the talent availability. Yeah. So I think it's much, much more complicated than just, um, the language itself uh, depends, you know, on the domain of problem that you're trying to solve. Maybe you've got some technical requirements outside of language take, for example, being our API that we wanted cheap Linux servers for that. Um, you might have the talent situation, and that might be that you're attracting new talent or what talent you already have mm -hmm. and whether it's, you know, whether they're comfortable with that. Um, they're all different areas to, to think about. Um, I also think, though, that languages tend to also have a little bit of a... Um, a life cycle to them like um you know i'm excited by a bunch of the stuff that's coming into say c plus uh, plus sorry c plus plus c sharp seven <laughs> but at the same time i'm like man there's now like several ways to do a lot of this stuff and it can often be syntactic sugar to reduce the number of lines of code yeah. but now i i sometimes think that reducing the lines of code is not necessarily a win because now i have to mentally unpack that back to my previous understanding of that model and you know, uh, you're just frankly, you're just an old cranky guy like us. i was gonna say i i'm both the old cranky guy and i'm also not very smart so yeah. you know it's uh <laughs> yeah welcome um, to the club <laughs> but but my thing is it's kind of like the complexity um well, not complexity, but the surface area of those languages can get quite large. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about um, starting programming and how I said, you know, download one thing and away you go with Node. Um, I kind of felt like, say, in 2005, you could argue that Ruby on Rails was a great way to get started with web stuff. And now I feel like there's so much baggage there that it would actually be quite difficult to be a first-time programmer trying to pick that up. And that's just part of that maturity curve that kind of occurs with, with any software uh, development environment, programming language, runtime, you know, the whole stack. Mm. Um, so that's something else I'd also consider. Yeah, uh, so, so I, yeah, sorry. I, so I talk to, um, you know, development teams and they will, they will ask me kind of that question like, hey, we're using, you know, let's say Java or .NET or Node, and they want to switch to one of the other ones. They're like, oh, we hear this. Uh, and I think this happens a little bit less often now, but they're like, hey, we hear this Node thing is pretty cool. Uh, should we should we switch over to this? And Microsoft is like, you, you have to have a good reason. Like in your case, I think you had some low-hanging fruit with kind of a hard, hard or a, a high ROI. Um, but, you know, for the most part, like rewriting your code is what I would say was generally a bad idea. Would you agree with that? I think so. Um, I tend to think that we think uh, refactoring and repaying technical debt is harder than it actually is. And conversely, we think that rewriting from the ground up is easier than yeah, it actually is. That's a, yeah, so, that's, a really, that's a really good uh, way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the other thing, too, is it comes down to the skill of the engineer. And nobody is great at, any, uh, at everything. And I've... Uh, I've worked with engineers that were just like refactoring gods. You know, they were the ones that would know arguably almost all of the keyboard shortcuts, say, in ReSharper. And they're just like <laughs> wizards, you know, and you're watching classes flying around and methods being pulled out. And that's their core skill, but they might be terrible at, say, a Greenfields project. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's also something to consider. Yeah. So, I mean, you did do this re rewrite, though. And one of the things that I was wondering is having a product like Raygun, does, did that make this rewrite easier? Or how did you use Raygun? Well, if Raygun didn't exist, they wouldn't Raygun. have to rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. So we get asked a little bit about, like, do you use Raygun to monitor Raygun? And the answer is we do. Um, but we also have to monitor that critical path, which would say, you know, like, for example, if the API is down, how could we receive our own error message to process <laughs> right, it? Right. Um, so we have secondary sort of monitoring that's um, a mixture of handcrafted and some commercial tools um, for tracking that that flow in and understanding what's going on there. Um, so Raygun, for example, we don't use uh, Raygun to monitor those API nodes themselves because that would just turn into an infinite yeah. loop. I, I um, just talked to another company that had this exact same problem. It was the exact same thing. 
they basically have like a, a database product that um, is great at storing like performance counter type information. And they were asking, they're like, what should we use for performance counters? And I was like, oh, just use, you know, like this here. And they're just like, well, yeah, but like people use us for their performance count. You know, you really have this weird, this really weird yeah. loop where they can't even like use their own stuff because if they're not working, you know, then it'll just everything will explode. And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we, we have like a custom logging and, and monitoring infrastructure that we have in there. And then and like, for example, our web, web app, however, and all of our different workers and things um, on the back end, they're all instrumented using Raygun itself. Um, and the, the web interface is being performance monitored by Raygun, um, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, because that works. But yeah. Okay. So speaking of like performance monitoring and KPIs, um, so like, as a, in general, um, you guys being kind of the, the experts in this area, um, what, what types of, of those KPIs and data streams do you think that developers are not looking at enough? I mean, I, I've generally looked at like, you know, errors and Hey, there's a lot of errors going on. Uh, but like what, what types of data aren't people looking at enough? Well, one of the things that I think, um, is not being looked at enough as impacted users. So I talk to a bunch of people at larger organizations, say like uh, Amazon and Microsoft and places like that, where when something goes wrong with their infrastructure, it's really important to understand the customer impact. And I find that most smaller organizations don't know. So if they have 10,000 errors, they don't know if that's 10,000 errors affecting 10,000 people or one person who's had 10,000 errors. <laughs> um, that's me. And so... Yeah, I always look at that uh, and say, look, don't prioritize your efforts based on the count. The counts are largely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. the, the number of affected users is a really big deal. And having a, a tool set that can tell you that number right off the bat is super powerful. Um, so that's important um, to, to understand. And I, yeah, that's, that's one KPI we track. Another one is uh, how quickly you're resolving your errors. So are they floating around for a long time or are they being responded to quickly? And, you know, uh, are you allocating time to, to resolving them to keep them low? It's also a sign of how responsive the team can be um, to new information being fed in. So something goes wrong, how quickly from the point of it going wrong to an uh, improvement being in production. And uh, I kind of go back to way back in the day when we were building um, – normal sort of developer components and we're one of the first companies out there that did daily or nightly builds of everything and so somebody posts in the forum and say oh the object relational mapper has this error and you'd be like cool okay well in like seven hours time there'll be a new build out that's got a fix for that that's a way to turn a disenchanted customer into a huge advocate right and so that's also one of the benefits. What's our turnaround time on, on these bugs? Aspose offers a powerful set of file management APIs with which developers can create applications, which can create, open, edit, and save the majority of popular business file formats. Their product range supports a multitude of file formats, including Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, PDF documents, OneNote, Outlook, Project, Visio files, popular image formats, and many others. Aspose produces APIs for .NET, Java, and the cloud, which can be utilized in almost any modern language available today. Visit Aspose.com for a free 30-day no limitations trial, and if you get stuck, message the friendly support team for help. All technical support is offered free of charge. And remember, if you are a lucky winner, you will receive a free developer small business license for Expose.net, a powerful toolkit for working with Word documents in your applications. So the kind of things that Jason mentioned, there, there are things that, you know, as a developer, I, you know, I kind of go to. But a lot of times I think that there's maybe things that we can be uh, collecting that would help the business goals. Um, uh, it, of our organization that we're part of what, what are kinds of things that we can instrument that would help the business out, not just ourselves making sure that we have the best applications. Yeah. So, um, I will be posting a blog post, uh, next week on the Raygun blog about an issue we actually just resolved this week. So we built our own AB testing framework, hmm. um, and it stores the data for that in Redis and got a notification that there was this Redis issue this week with a timeout and went in, had a quick look at the data 
and went, okay, this has affected 365 users. And what it turns out is that as we've sort of grown in popularity, we've sort of overloaded this little Redis instance that was storing the AB test data. Now, as an engineer, you know, my first feeling towards a tool that's helping you with this is to kind of go, oh, good. I, one, I, I found out about it before a customer told me. And secondly, uh, I didn't have to go and find a log file on a server to figure out what was going wrong. I could fix this quickly. But if you then dig a little deeper to the business situation, which is that's 360 odd users that have had a bad experience when they've hit the website because they've gone nearer. Uh, we pay for some of that traffic to come to the site. So even if it was 10% of the traffic, and let's say it was $5 per click, that's about 130 bucks that the business has wasted in marketing spend that's, you know might as well have just been lit on fire. Um, you can start to actually understand the business implications of poor quality software. Uh, but a lot of engineers, we don't tend to think in economic terms. Um, you know, we had a person cancel their, their rate going account the other day, and they said, we're just trying to manage costs, so we're building our own tool internally, and they're paying $39 <laughs> a month. And you're like, okay, you're either working for free, or this was a really bad economic decision yeah. to make. <laughs> but we don't tend to think about the business side. So some of the things that we've done, and again, I know we're not here to talk specifically about Raygun, but there's... Um, there's an example in our real user monitoring where we take all of this performance data. We can tell you about if there's SSL issues, the server times, the render times and browsers, all that data. And then we still boil it down to a chart, which we can give you that says, how many of my users are having an excellent experience? How many of them are having a mediocre one? And how many are having a bad experience? And that's a combination of performance timing as well as errors. And that can be a really useful tool to go back to the business and say, look, we would like to allocate some time. Perhaps it's to performance work. Perhaps it's to repaying technical debt and being able to say, look, if only 5% of our users are having an excellent experience and 90% are yeah. having a bad one, we need to fix this, guys. Because you're now talking a little bit more in the language of the VPs, the C-suite and all yeah. of that. And they kind of go, yeah, OK, that makes sense. Um, and we've always found that when we talk with some of our larger enterprise customers, they implicitly get that. They understand performance and bugs. You know, they're spending such large budgets. The ability to nuke spend really quickly um, is high, so they understand it. Small, medium businesses don't tend to think that way as much, right. and I think that's a, an issue to, to overcome. Yeah, that's such a great point. I really like that, you know, because, cause, yeah, developers want – it's like, oh, we want to pay down this debt, you know, and it's sort of for the sake of, like, paying it down. Uh, no. but, but being able to, you know, and usually it's just lack of easy data to get to. Um, exactly. Yeah. So if you have that easy connection with the customer experience, I, I really like that. Yeah. Well, if you go into any argument, debate, discussion, whatever, and say, we should do this because I think we should do this, that's a terrible argument, right? It's the bring data. Uh, I, you know, we talk about the same thing at, at Reagan. One of our core values is assume nothing, measure everything. Because if you want us to redesign the homepage, you better bring me the data that shows that the last change was an issue or here is your hypothesis and we should run an A-B test because it would deliver this this outcome. Same thing needs to be done in engineering. Yeah, I mean, I think the only the downside that I run into, so Microsoft is, is very much the same way. Um, and it can be frustrating uh, because... Like, let's take the, the homepage redesign issue. You know, if you have, um, I don't, maybe that's, maybe that's not a good example to, to build on. But if I think, um, um, okay, so let's say you're all your, all your current audience is developers, but you think you can sell to business users, you know, because mm -hmm. of like what we just talked about. And it's like, hey, if we redesign our, our webpage, like, I'm pretty sure we can double, um, or I, I, you know, I, I just have this feeling that we can like double the number of business users that we get, you know? Um, and we sort of all look at each other and we're like, yeah, like that makes a whole lot of sense. Cause right now, like we have all these terms on there. It's like those math equations, these business users are just like, they're just leaving the site right away probably. Um, you know, and it's just something that you can't measure. Like there's things that you have to take a risk on, um, to, to get the data. And it sounds like you guys do AB testing. So I guess, you know, there's, there's always gotta be like a little bit of risk to gather the data. Right. And then mm -hmm. you have the data. Right. So then, so it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to like have a few, a few times we're going to show this other homepage. And if we show that it's more effective, maybe it's like twice as effective, then we have the data to back that up. But you got to take that initial risk, don't you? You absolutely do. And this is one of the things that I've, again, the importance of measuring things is it's, 
I say I, I find I say this a lot more to marketing than any other team just because marketing commands a reasonable budget, right? Is I will never, as the CEO of this business, I will never be angry with somebody for spending money on an experiment that turns out that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Because now we know verifiably that it doesn't work. We, we have mm -hmm. become smarter through mm -hmm. that investment, you know, yep. to, you know, um, to quote, Batman, you know, why do we fall <laughs> down, Master Bruce? So we pick ourselves up, right? Like you've got to, that's how you learn, right? Yeah. By making mistakes. Um, I would, I hate it when we're sitting there going, maybe if we did this, it would have this positive outcome. I don't want to sit there thinking maybe for the rest of my days. I'm like, let's go try it. And I, okay. and I love it when engineers bring the same sort of thinking, like maybe if we, I saw, um, speaking of Stack Overflow earlier, was it, um, might have been, one of the guys on Twitter talking about how they were going to probably try Nick. putting Nick yeah, Graber, Nick, probably. It's like 10,000 different schemas Schemos. or something. Yeah. And it was like, this guy's mad, but I like the fact they're trying it, you know, to, to find out what the impact is. And that's the important thing. If you're yeah. too afraid to try anything, you might as well shut the damn business down, stop the project, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I like I like your approach to it because and and again I'm not I'm not speaking for like all of Microsoft but you know Microsoft's obviously a huge company and there's a lot of different engineering groups but I have talked to somewhere I'm like hey like I have this idea that's going to change the freaking world and they're like yeah but we have no way of collecting data on it before you do it and it's like well can I I'll just do it like it's gonna take me a weekend they're like we don't have data that shows that that's gonna work and it's like yeah, because you've never you've even tried it yet um, so I run up against it so I like your approach a little bit it's like well let's Let's figure out how we can try it um, to get that data. And I think I think that's a, a a better approach. And I actually suspect that that's what most teams do. I mean, otherwise you can yeah, like you, to your point, you can never create anything new if yep. if you're if you just say we have to have the data first. You have to take that leap. Well, I'd flip it around. I use another analogy, yeah. and this is going to be about software bugs, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Oh, but we have this QA team and the software developers are writing unit tests and all of that. Do you need a production environment crash reporting product? Absolutely. Because <laughs> no matter how much you try and do things before the show really starts, there will be there will be things you learn that you can only learn from being out in the wild. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same there with the data. You might be able to go and run a focus group. It might take you six months to collate the data and do all of that. And then you actually go and do it and you put it in front of people in production and it's terrible. It's the same thing when we're designing new features, right? Our design team will take direction from our head of product, design up some sort of beautiful interface and all of this. We'll circulate them and all post comments and stuff on it. Then it'll go to front end, they'll start building it out, then they'll surface it in a beta environment to the team and sometimes you sit there and go wow i really liked it when it was a static image but now that i'm using the damn thing it's terrible it's so non-intuitive i can't and that again same sort of thing how do you how do you do this stuff without ever actually taking it to that degree yeah. where people can use and experience it you have to accept that yeah and then i i wanted to kind of ask kind of a general you know since we're talking about like software we've sort of gone into just like general software quality um so on, on that side of things, um, you know, there's, there's all these like industry, I, well, I don't want to call them buzzwords cause they're like totally legitimate. There's, there's things like uh, unit testing, which I'm a fan of. Um, there's the solid principles. Um, there's, you know, things like DevOps, like we keep hearing these things. And if you go to a conference, you'll hear the, the latest thing and they, you have to be doing this. Like you can't live without this. You can't write good software without this. And I, th I think you would say like the, the instrumentation that you had, and, and I'm not saying this like it's a bad thing. Like you're like, you have to have this. So we have all, we have this like huge list of things that we absolutely have to have according to whoever you talk to. Um, so like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you think that there are things that, that maybe are less important on that list or are there things that we can get rid of? Like, how do you, how do you take this massive, massive list of things that are absolutely required and, uh, and you know, that, that you can never in, unless you have a massive team, you could never hope to do all of those things. How do you how do you survive? How do you build software? Well, I think first and foremost, you've got to accept that the technology space is always changing. So you know you're never going to have finished the list of things to do. That's just never going to happen. Secondly, a lot of these things um, are supposed to save you time and make you more efficient. So you could actually handle more things happening, um, but 
uh, not be overwhelmed. You shouldn't have to add more people. We talk about this a little bit at work from time to time where it's like, well, do we want to add another team member or do we just want to spend some some time making our processes more efficient and effectively and, you yeah. know maybe within a week we've got an extra FTE worth of effort available and you know a classic case would be if we talked about say um, CICD and you know I might get somebody to take some time to set up Team City and use Octopus Deploy to, to push it out there and it might take us a week or so to get that up and running but now we don't have this very laborious deployment process right. we can orchestrate and in and, and theory uh, and Frankly, the CICD is a good one where it absolutely should give you more time. So now you've got an extra thing on on your plate that you've got this whole process and all these tools, but you should be able to get more done more quickly. Um, so I think unless that uh, measure is proven, as in it saves you time and actually has, again, we're not very good at thinking in terms of economic benefit as engineers. Mm-hmm. Um, and economic doesn't just mean dollars, it can mean time. Um then you shouldn't do it. And I know there was that sort of uh, bit clickbaity article the other day that came out from somebody at Microsoft, which was, um, you know, uh, test-driven development is dead and a waste of time. You know, I, I was about to say, like, and I, I don't think that I, I actually didn't see that one. I've seen other ones where, like, you could, I'm, I'm sure, like, let me search for, uh, <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, like, DevOps is, is dead. Uh, dead. It auto-completed it. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Look at this: a slash dot article, Forbes article. These are the, here we go. I love this. I love this. May May twenty eighth, twenty fifteen. Is DevOps dead? <laughs> Logic Monitor suggests so. Uh, a lot of them are DevOps is dead. Long live DevOps. So you know, I guess we get exclude uh, you know exclude those ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. DevOps is DOA from ZDNet. I gotta look at this one. This was. October 4th, 2011. <laughs> wow. So, so I'm pretty sure like you could take any of these things and say like is dead yep. and you'll find somebody who says is dead, which, which well, makes it all the more complicated. My point though um, there is I feel like TDD, some people can do it very efficiently, but mm-hmm. sometimes it actually has a higher cost than what it's actually yeah. delivering you. Um, the, the thing is like taking, for example, our products, not knowing what's actually going on with your software. Like here is almost every single enterprise sale I'm involved in. Right. So which, uh, you know, we think that you should be on the enterprise tier. Oh, we think we could be on the startup one. There's no way we have more than 25,000 euros a month. Okay. Run mm-hmm. the free trial. Oh, we have a million errors a day that we didn't know about. Like, <laughs> that, that is pretty much like every sale call. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the thing is it's like get the stuff in and they are, now the team knows what's there and they have the context to fix it. It should speed you up. It should allow somebody to go from fixing a couple of bugs a week to maybe fixing 20 bugs a week and yeah. making the cut. If you cannot show an economic benefit at the end of it, you should not be doing it. Okay. Um, as well. Cut, cutting to DevOps in particular. Yeah. Um, I'm. I like the fact, that, <laughs> in, a, in a terrible way, <laughs> that if I got ten people in a room and said, "What's DevOps?" I'll get ten different answers. <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm a bit more of the school. Um, there's a lady in New Zealand who tweets a lot about DevOps that I follow. Uh, runs her name, and uh, she talks about it more from being a cultural standpoint um, mm. about empathy and team and all of that. And I think I'm, I'm not quite that extreme. I think there are some very concrete things like, Hey, DevOps involves automating things and making sure that you have like a build server and you can, re- there's repeatability to stuff and all of that. But you are actually talking about it from a cultural standpoint of developers are understanding a bit of what's going on in operations, but equally operations should understand what's happening in development. You're, you're going away from this model of, and I've seen this before, is people that think I write the software and I throw it over the wall to the QA team and then I wait for it to come back or go to production and I don't know. And in the meantime, I'm either reading reddit or uh you know like whatever they're doing i don't yeah. know yeah let me I, find out what technology i should be using now <laughs> yeah so i i'm often a little bit surprised when i hear a company say they have a devops team 
because I'm like, well, aside from maybe a few people that own those automations and those pieces, like maybe if, if I'm somebody yeah. like Salesforce, yeah, you probably have this huge fleet of infrastructure you've got to manage. But actually, DevOps to me is is much more about the way that the developers think and engage around the business. They probably do understand the the business implications a bit better and the pains that other teams have, and they're thinking more holistically um, about what they're doing. Okay. So I, I know this is a little bit uns, unsolicited, but uh, I actually am starting a new mobile application, and I just spun up and put Raygun as the instrumentation in there. And I think one thing that's really interesting is talking about how you mentioned like how important it is to kind of get up quickly and kind of once you get this stuff in there, it'll save you time. Uh, I, I created a new account. I followed the instructions. In fact, you gave me the code to copy and paste. I just said what kind of app I'm using. You gave me the code and to told me where to put it. Yeah. Uh, so I copy pasted that over. And then I also add an integration right away to send it to a private Slack channel that I have. And uh, then you know, in the instruction it says, now force an error because you know, it might take you too long to collect one. And I forced an error and like immediately got a message in my Slack channel and it just showed up and it, this was all, all under five minutes. So yep. it was very low friction, very low barrier. <laughs> and the other thing I noticed that was kind of cool too, I would have never really thought about this unless I had put a lot of time to think about it. But in the UI of the dashboard that there is too, until it knows that you've set it up and, and are using it correctly, it shows you how to set it up in code. So uh, it, until I got that, first crash report come in it had the instructions on how to do that and then as soon as that came through now i'm getting the metrics for that and some of the pieces of offerings that you have that i haven't used yet still have those instructions in there and then slowly as i'm using it more and more it's lighting up with this information and then i didn't even notice it until you brought it up but at the top of the dashboard it says like user satisfaction and average and it's got a little bar and, you know, <laughs> I, I, and, Put that know, on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> I have average. Well, granted, this is this is I'm only the one using it, so <laughs> I, I, I'm a pretty tough cookie. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to keep well, it. Well, I, I mean, just. You know, I appreciate that feedback. We put a lot of time in trying to make that onboarding as easy as possible. You know, one of the, again, you know, obviously stretch from the engineering side over to the business side and one of the the other challenges we run into with sales calls is everybody says things take 15 minutes to set up no matter what it is you know i feel like i could ring a builder and say i'm thinking of building a house how long they tell me 15 minutes um <laughs> everybody lies right and i've said they're going it's not a lie it's not a lie try yeah. it you know 15 minutes <laughs> is a long time like sitting there <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know i'm not just saying that uh because you're here, but I'm saying it because it, it kind of really fits the conversation and kind of reinforces some of the things that we were talking about. If you can make those things happen, it really does have that huge impact. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yep. do um, uh, ping tests? Uh, the I mean, there's lots of good services that do that. I'm just curious. Yeah. If, if, if we, we don't, we don't do a synthetic test ourselves uh, at the moment. Um, the real user monitoring is tracking the time for the actual individual users. Okay. Um, so there is that, and there's a general school, there's two sort of schools of thought. One is uh, ping tests are good for telling you perhaps if a system's down, but yeah. they, they're actually really bad for telling you performance. That's where you really want the real Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So, so let me let me tell you what happened to the MS Dev Show site one time. <laughs> <laughs> so if you host your ping tests in the same account as the thing that you're pinging, and you're and you have account issues <laughs> you don't get notified <laughs> oh wow yeah so that's why i was thinking maybe you might want to consider that like i said there's lots of good services out there that will do like ping tests but just a pro tip for our listeners and we could call this our azure pick of the week uh put you know even if you use this as a separate azure account like put your ping test somewhere else <laughs> um somewhere that's like it, that's independent so that when your stuff does go down for an account issue in my case it was uh it was just my msdn it was um i burned through all the money because they're i i always uh turn on previews for different things and i i ran into this interesting like infinite loop loop bug that basically burned through all of my azure money pretty instantly 
So <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that well, you know, the thing is, like, I I find those bugs so that uh, you know users don't have to run into them. Uh, yeah. I always try out all the preview stuff and run into the funny stuff like that. Uh, but so yeah, your point is... here, though, just to be clear, is run it from another account in case the account ceases operating, yeah, right? It's yeah, not yeah. that it wouldn't have alerted you just because it was on the same account. It otherwise would have been fine if your account had been running. Yes. Had, had yeah. it gone down for any other issue, it would have been fine. But, I, I you know, yeah. I just ran into like the weirdest edge case. So because <laughs> <laughs> I think it was it was like a listener who like, you know, tweeted at Carl and was like, hey, your site is down. And I'm like, why didn't I get notified? I go in there and it's like, you're over your spend limit. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions for, for him, Carl? Nope. That's all that I have. Okay. And then what do you have for the dev tip of the week, Carl? The dev tip of the week uh, is something that I, I don't think gets enough attention from developers no. is in visual studio. If you dig far enough on the new project list, uh, sometimes it's even really hard to find, but they have the little search box. Just type in database and there's a database project. And I really super highly recommend everybody use this to manage the schemas of their database. Uh, not only do you keep your schema version controlled along with your code, but it makes deploying um not just to production, but to your dev database super easy. You can add something in, in SSMS, uh, you know to a new, uh, create a new table or change properties mm -hmm. or whatever, you can use a schema compare to suck that into the database project. And the database project can push that change out to production yep. or to another developer's um, uh, database. And it's super amazing. I just got done telling somebody on my team about that this week, and it kind of blew his mind, like it did mine yeah. when I first learned about it years ago. Yeah, because, I mean, it, it figures out like the... The, basically the quickest path to do the upgrade it'll it'll write the sql statements and do the upgrade for you and then i think the the other really cool thing about it is sure it's a date quote unquote database project uh but it'll define like the tables and the store procedures and whatever but what's amazing is you know it, it, for whatever reason i'd sort of initially think that those would be stored in some kind of magical binary but they're actually just stored as text so the tables it's literally a sql file that says like you know create table um, so it's just the SQL statements in there. So you can store your database in source con source control. And if you ever change, like a, if you add a column, for example, and you go look at the, the diff, it will literally just be, you know, here was the column that was added and you can see it in a text based way. It's really awesome. And, and like, I, like I mentioned, like if you need to go back in time to like a previous version, let's just say you have a customer for some reason, they're like three versions back. You can actually just revert back to that, that time period in your code and then push the database schema that was available then. Yeah. So it just makes that dead simple. Okay. Uh, so what I need you to do now is pick a number between one and four and inclusive and let me know what it is. Me? Yes. Yes. Between one and four. Yes, inclusive. And, it, and is it an integer? Yes. <laughs> three. Great. Now I always have to say that. Three. What is the appeal of three? Okay, here we go. I have found. I found a. I found a three that we haven't used yet. Would you rather always feel like you almost have to sneeze, or have everything that touches you tickle? <laughs> Ooh. That's both. Both of those sound horrible. Did. Does my clothing count as stuff that's touching me? Like, am I feeling tickled well, the so, whole time? So, so here's the thing. Usually, like, if you have special powers, like invisibility or, uh, like, super speed or you turn into, like, uh, fire, uh, your clothes in many cases are fine. So I will say that uh, the things that touch you, like, the clothes are exempt from that. Okay, and the same with the floor, I assume. Won't feel like my feet are being tickled just because I'm standing. Yeah, and I guess I would, because this says everything that touches you, but I think if you touch it, maybe you're okay. All right. I don't know, but like, let's say you're you're on fire and you sit down in your car, you're going to light the car on fire. Right. So if you sit in your car, you're going to get tickled. Yeah, I'm also thinking like I'm okay. typing on my keyboard. Is it tickling my fingertips? <laughs> like... Well, I, I would know. say yes. I would say yes. Okay, sure. Otherwise, yeah, because I think that's probably roughly equivalent then. Because, I mean, the other option is only when something t touches you. You know, So, like, if it moves toward you and touches you. 
I kind of feel like as annoying as it would be to feel like I was always about to sneeze, the not knowing when I'm going to feel like I'm being tickled would be more annoying. Um, so I, I'll go with the sneezing one. Both of those just, they sound like the worst punishments ever, don't they? I mean, yeah. It's almost like worse than like, you know, like having your arm hurt all the time or something. It's just like, yeah. Oh. Well, I'm also we're like in our household, you know, if I say to my wife, oh, man, my, my leg is dead. It's getting pins and needles. She will come over and just like attack that leg to drive me insane. <laughs> so if I was like open to being tickled with the simplest of touches, I would be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, Carl, pick a number. I'll do number four. Number four. OK. Would you rather? I think we had this one, but I'm going to do it again anyway. Would you rather eat dog food for one meal per day or eat regular food that has been chewed on by dogs for one meal per day? Dog food. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> regular food. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, even well, though there's some nasty stuff in dog food, dogs' mouths aren't as clean as what everybody says. Okay. I mean, they eat their own poo. They eat their, like, <laughs> rabbit poo. You know, I, why do we do the show? Um, <laughs> well, and dog food is not controlled by the FDA, though. That's the that's the thing. First thing that popped in my head. No, it's still dog food. Yeah, I mean, like you might die. I mean, just to, could, I'm just saying. Yeah. You could always yeah. just eat high quality dog food. That's yeah, true. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Go out buy the good stuff. And can your family your feed you from the table? <laughs> 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 like, can you sit on the floor and? feel like you have to sneeze and somebody can feed you i don't know i don't know <laughs> okay <laughs> i think it's time to end the show jason <laughs> yeah so john daniel where can uh where can people find you um so on twitter i'm trask jd t-r-a-s-k-j-d um and raygun's on twitter is r-a-y-g-u-n-i-o raygun i-o based on our old tld um and our website is at raygun.com, which, um, yeah, like you said, we're, we're really happy to be sponsoring the show. So I'm sure there'll be some links somewhere. Yep. yep. Ab- well, yeah, we always we have links all over the place. Actually, that is one funny thing, because there's a the, the URL for some reason is getting getting picked up by by ad block. But we're going to correct that. Um, yeah, we're, we're super happy to have uh, Raygun sponsor. Um, it's it's such a cool product and we, we love talking about it. Uh, so, Carl, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Carl Schweitzer. And you can find me at YTechie.com or on Twitter at Twitter.com slash YTechie. So, John, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about software quality and also talking about your, your conversion from Node to .NET. It's very cool. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on again. <laughs>